Thousands of students are gathering on university and college campuses throughout the nation for the fall term. To some who have just left high school, it will be a tremendous change. To other thousands, it will be returning to a familiar spot filled with happy memories and hard study. The school year 1958-59 promises to have more emphasis on religion than any year since the turn of the century. With the scientists bewildered and the philosopher floundering, the proclaimer of religion will have a greater ear on the college campus this fall than ever before. It is my privilege each year to go to various colleges and universities. I'm finding a greater response among students than any other group in the country. As I was walking across one campus last year to give an address, a sophomore came up to me and said, Mr. Graham, you won't let us down, will you? I was puzzled and asked him what he meant. He said, please tell us how to find God. That's what we need. When I was speaking at Yale University last year, a student came to me and said, Mr. Graham, we hear a lot about what Christ has done for us, the value of religion and what personal salvation is, but nobody tells us how to find Christ. This lament of an honest student became a serious challenge to me and in every sermon since, before university and college students, I've tried to tell them simply and plainly how to find Christ. Millions of Americans take for granted the basic elements of the Christian faith. However, there are millions of other Americans that are just as ignorant of the way of salvation is taught in the New Testament as those untouched tribes in South America or Africa. The Bible teaches that God has made the plan of redemption so plain that a wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. But knowing about Christ, the cross, and the way of salvation is one thing, but appropriating it to yourself is quite another. There are thousands of students on the campuses this fall that have an intellectual comprehension of the Christian faith, but have never made Christ vital to their own lives. Today, I would like to speak very simply on how to find the assurance of salvation. First, you must recognize your need. You will never come to Christ unless you are convinced that you need him. If you feel that you're self-sufficient, capable of meeting life head-on under your own power, then you will probably never come face to face with Jesus Christ. A reading of the Gospels will reveal that he only answered the cry of those who were conscious of their needs. He did not impose himself upon those who felt self-sufficient, righteous, and self-confident. However, he went out of his way to open the eyes of Bartimaeus who cried, Jesus, have mercy on me. He was quick to give the water of life to the Samaritan woman who confessed, I have no man to draw for me and the well is deep. He was instantly at the side of the sinking Peter when he prayed, Master, save me or I perish. We have no instance of Christ refusing help to anyone who saw in him the answer of their deepest needs. On the other hand, we have no record of his imposing himself on any person who refused his presence and power. There must be a recognition of your own sinfulness and spiritual need before there can be a response from Christ. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Before you can be saved, you must realize that you're lost. Before you can be forgiven, you must realize that you've sinned. Before you can be converted, you must be convinced that you're going the wrong way. Every divine promise hinges on a human condition. As many have received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. If we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have a promise if we meet God's conditions. We must receive before we have Christ. We must walk in the light before we are cleansed. And we must confess before we are forgiven. The scriptures teach all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Perhaps you have never felt that you are a sinner. You have never committed a gross immoral act. Thus, by faith, you must receive the teaching of God's word that you have come short of his requirements. This must be done by faith. You may not feel it. You may not know it. But by faith, you accept the fact that you are a sinner. Even the most perfect person that ever lived was a sinner, except Jesus Christ, of course. Isaiah, the great prophet, seeing the purity and holiness of God, cried, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. Job, who had suffered long because of his faith in God, said, I abhor myself. Peter, the great apostle, who was willing to be crucified upside down for his Savior, said, I am a sinful man. Thus, all of us are sinners in the sight of God. 
we must recognize our sins and be willing to confess them. When we have a physical need, we go to the doctor. When we recognize that we have a moral and spiritual disease, we must come to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one in heaven or earth qualified to deal with the complex problems of the human heart. If the United Nations would realize that the basic problem of the world is spiritual and moral, this could become the first step toward world peace. However, the United Nations is making the mistake that all great deliberating bodies like it in the past have made. It deals with symptoms rather than causes. The cause is sin. This is the same mistake many of you are making in your own life. You have thought that your problem was a result of an unfortunate marriage or perhaps unfavorable working conditions, or perhaps your problem was physical or psychological, when perhaps the basic problem lies within your own soul. You have offended God by your sin and found that there is no strength to live the kind of life you know you should live. The moment you recognize this need and are willing to turn to Christ by faith, you have taken the first step towards salvation and redemption. Secondly, you must understand the cross. This sounds almost impossible because even the greatest theologians have never understood the mysteries of the cross. This is a difficulty that seems almost insurmountable from the human viewpoint. Even the Bible says that the natural man cannot comprehend the things of God. So how can a person understand the cross before he finds Christian assurance? When we see Christ dying and shedding his blood for our sins, we stand awed, amazed, and mystified. We are strangely drawn. We cannot even understand our own feelings. We cannot understand so great a love as this. Many intellectuals have made up theories as to why Christ died and what the eternal significance of his death was. None of them seem to fit and satisfy by themselves. It is only when we understand that Christ was dying in the place of sinners for sin do we find an element of satisfaction. Yet how can we understand it? Here is where the miracle is. Just as Peter, by a divine revelation, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, so by a miracle the meaning of the cross will be given you by the Holy Spirit. I recall a young reporter in Glasgow who attended the meetings at Kelvin Hall as part of his assignment. He heard the gospel night after night, but it made no obvious impact upon him. However, one day when one of his colleagues asked him, what are they preaching down there? He tried to explain the gospel, and in so doing, he said, You see, it's this way. Christ died for me. Christ died for my sins. And when he said that, he suddenly realized that it was true. The full meaning of those words, as if by a miracle, burst in upon him. And then and there, he received the assurance of salvation. The Apostle Paul had the seeds of skepticism planted within him. But as the martyr Stephen preached of the just one of whom ye have now been the betrayers and murderers, the meaning of the cross flashed into his soul. This led to a personal encounter with the crucified one. And Paul, using the cross like a rapier, cut a swath for God across the face of the pagan world. How vivid, how alive the cross becomes when Paul speaks tenderly of it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. When you see him high and lifted up, the Son of God, smitten, marred, bruised, and dying for you, and can say with Paul, who loved me and gave himself for me, you have taken the second step toward Christian assurance. Thirdly, you must count the cost. Jesus discouraged superficial enthusiasm. He urged people to consider well the cost of being a disciple. Many times when great crowds were following him, he would turn and say, Have you counted the cost? Do you realize that if any man will come after me, he will have to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me? He again said, Which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Many people come to Christ without first counting the cost. The cost includes repentance the forsaking of sin, and a continual daily open acknowledgement of Christ in your life. These are the minimum requirements of discipleship. The Christian life is not for the weak, the soft, or the coward. Ben Mooring, who has a camp in New York for making young hoodlums into Christians, says, Being a Christian is the toughest thing in the world. What's tougher than loving your enemy? One boy, who has developed into a rugged disciple of Christ at this camp, recently said, in this outfit, we're all brothers and we're all men. 
It was too tough for me at first, but then I heard that through Christ everything is possible. Then the roughness went away. I say a man is not a man, not a full man, until he gets to know Jesus Christ, said this lad. Yes, the Christian life is tough and rough, but it's challenging. It's worth everything we pay to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You will soon find that the cross is not greater than his grace. When you pick up the cross of unpopularity on the campus this fall, you will find God's grace is there, more than sufficient to meet your every need. Fourthly, you must take a definite step. A student at Stanford University of a non-Christian faith came to me on the campus one day last spring and said that he was convinced that Jesus was the Son of God, but that he couldn't confess him publicly. He said the cost socially would be too great back in his own country. I had to tell him that the Bible says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Like the rich young ruler of old, he went away sadly. He had counted the cost and was not able to pay the price of open acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as his Savior. We ask people to make a public confession of Christ in our meetings because Christ demanded a definite commitment. In a few days, the Charlotte Crusade that has been more than a year in preparation will get underway in North Carolina. Thousands of unchurched and unsaved people will be coming from various parts of the South to attend those meetings. We are going to ask them night after night to come forward and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. There is no such thing as a secret disciple. Christ had reasons for demanding that people openly follow him. He knew that an unwitnessed vow is no vow at all. There are three little men that live down in every one of us. One is intellect, another is emotion, and a third is will. Intellectually, you may accept Christ. Emotionally, you may feel that you can love him. But until, by a definite act of your will, you have surrendered to Christ, you are not a Christian. Have you taken this definite step? The Bible says, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Fifthly, allow God to revise your life. When you come to Christ, you are considered a spiritual baby. As you read the chapters of the New Testament, you will see how the early disciples during the first days of following Christ faltered and often failed. They quarreled, they were envious, they were contentious, they were unfaithful, and they often grew angry. But as they became emptied of self and filled with Christ, they developed into the fullness of the stature of a Christian. Conversion is just the beginning, but a new life has begun in you the moment you receive Christ. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence during the rest of your lifetime. He will be busy conforming you to the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, you will be a target of Satan, the enemy of Christ. When you walked Satan's way in the world, he didn't bother you. He had you. You were his child. But now, since you have received Christ and are a child of God, he will use all his diabolical techniques to thwart, hinder, and defeat you. When you come to Christ, your moral behavior must experience a readjustment. You will find a new desire to do right and the strength to do it. There will be flashbacks to the old life, and there will be moments when you feel like going back as a sow to his wallowing in his mire. But remembering who you are now, you have received Christ, and you're following and serving him. You now have Christ's nature within you, and greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. If you are faithful in church attendance, Bible reading, prayer, and witnessing, he will work in you and through you. You will find yourself saying with Paul, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You will find miracles happening all around you as you discipline your life to the pattern of a true Christian. Christian assurance can be yours today. Would you not like to know that every sin is forgiven? Wouldn't you like to know that you're ready to meet God no matter what happens in this nuclear age? There are five steps. Here they are. First, you must recognize your need. Secondly, you must understand the cross. Thirdly, you must count the cost. Fourthly, you must take a definite step of commitment. Fifthly, you must allow God to revise your life. Has this all happened to you? If not, it could happen today. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that men and women who need the Savior will come taking these steps sincerely today, having their lives transformed by the touch of the Master, 
our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins 2,000 years ago. Draw us by thy spirit today to his cross and may we sense his forgiveness for we ask it in his name. Amen.